The chaos on the southern U.S. border continues. Christians in Iraq are terrorized by ISIS. Nebraska Congressman Jeff Fortenberry joins us to talk about all of it and his resolution to shield Iraqi Christians and religious minorities from attacks. And later, in our Unseen Hero segment, author Ron Suskind tells us about his son Owen's severe autism and how Disney films helped end his silence. And finally, he's the leader of tens of millions of Catholics in the Philippines, whose influence will soon be felt in Rome this October as one of the presidents of the upcoming Synod of Bishops. And encore, my exclusive interview with Cardinal Luis Tagle is straight ahead. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. So much news to share with you. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, Pulitzer Prize winner Ron Suskind, and Cardinal Louis Togley are all ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send us a tweet at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get started. Here's the brief. News from the world over this week. Israel's ground offensive in Gaza continues. On Thursday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that Israel would destroy the Hamas tunnel network in the Gaza Strip with or without a ceasefire. The tunnel network runs through Gaza and into Israel. 1,300 Palestinians mostly civilians and more than 50 Israelis, nearly all of them soldiers, have been killed since the conflict began on July 8th. Israel has been on the receiving end of more than a thousand Hamas rockets, yet they've received international criticism for the heavy loss of civilian lives. We'll discuss it in our next segment. And House Speaker John Boehner's pared-down bill addressing the immigration crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border has been resurrected. Lacking the votes for passage, the legislation was yanked from consideration early Thursday. A conservative revolt by members of the House and the general public was to blame. But later in the day, the bill came back to life. GOP leaders said they will delay their August recess until the, they vote on the bill. It provides funds for additional immigration judges, humanitarian aid, and would amend the law to hasten the deportation of young Central American illegal immigrants. We'll get into the details with Congressman Fortenberry in a bit. As America wrestles with immigration policy, a crackdown is underway in Great Britain. Well, Prime is, Minister David Cameron announced a plan on Monday that would cut benefits to EU migrants. Those benefits would be reduced from Russia, six months to three months. Putin. In an interview with the UK Telegraph, Cameron said migrants cannot expect to come to Britain and get something for nothing. Back in January, automatic benefits had already been cut for migrant job seekers. Child tax credits were slashed as well. The government plan would also ban the advertising of domestic jobs exclusively abroad. It will require ads for such openings to be run in the UK as well and in English. A spokesman for the UK Independence Party, UKIP, says the reforms don't go far enough. The party says the influx of more than 4 million migrants over the last 10 years has flooded the labor market and driven down wages for British citizens. And the government's crackdown on Christians in China's eastern provinces is intensifying, according to multiple reports. On Monday, hundreds of police stormed a church to remove a cross that stood atop its steeple. Last Friday, 4,000 police were brought in to remove two crosses atop another church. The dramatic show of force is in response to the communist regime's concern over the growth of Christianity. By some estimates, the number of Christians in China now equals the number of Communist Party members. Crosses have not been the only targets of government authorities since the beginning of the year. More than 100 churches have been ordered demolished for alleged zoning violations. 
And in Vietnam, a United Nations official said he experienced, quote, serious violations of religious freedom this week. While on a fact-finding mission in the country, UN special reporter Heiner Bielfeldt said he was surveilled and harassed by unidentified government security agents. They also reportedly intimidated individuals with whom he met. Religion remains under state supervision in Vietnam, which is predominantly Buddhist. In 2006, Vietnam was removed from the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom's list of countries of particular concern. But in their latest report, they recommend that Vietnam be returned to the list as a country of concern. The Holy See Press Office has announced the official dates of Pope Francis's apostolic journey to Sri Lanka and the Philippines. The pontiff will visit Sri Lanka from January 12th to the 15th of 2015. Then he's off to the Philippines until January 19th. More on Pope Francis and the church in the Philippines with Manila Cardinal Louis Tagle later in the show. And don't forget, right around the corner is the Holy Father's apostolic visit to Korea, and we will be there with you August 13th through 18th. EWTN will bring you live coverage of that historic event. And the ecumenical outreach of Pope Francis continues. On Monday, the Holy Father became the first pope to visit a Pentecostal church, speaking to some 350 congregants of the Southern Italy Church. The pope apologized and asked forgiveness on behalf of Catholics who persecuted Pentecostals during Italy's fascist regime. He decried those who saw Pentecostals, quote, as if they were crazies trying to ruin the race. The planned visit to the Pentecostal Church caused some controversy among local Catholics. Vatican journalist Sandro Magister reported last week that many believe the Pope should be visiting the Catholics in Caserta, Italy. The local bishop didn't even know about the Pentecostal visit until after it was announced in the media. After what was described as tense discussions, the Holy Father did change his plans. He met with local Catholics on Saturday before his Monday visit with the Pentecostals. And financial markets took a downward spiral this week after Argentina defaulted on its debt. The Dow plummeted 317 points to 16,563, a two-month low. This is the second debt default for Argentina in the last 13 years. The loss ends a five-month string of Dow and S&P gains. And finally, back here on Capitol Hill, a congressional resolution honoring Pope Francis for his example and inspiration is apparently stuck in legislative purgatory. The bill has the support of 201 Democratic House members, but only 19 Republicans. It's not received a single vote out of committee. Partisan politics could be at play. The Hill cites a Republican supporter who says fellow GOP members have withheld their support because Pope Francis is, quote, sounding like President Obama and is, quote, too liberal. The source specifically mentioned the Pope's criticism of free market economic policies. Lead sponsor Democrat John Larson of Connecticut has urged Speaker John Boehner to hold a vote on the resolution. We'll keep you posted. When we return, we'll talk about the crisis on the U.S. border, the ongoing Israeli incursion in Gaza, and a new effort to protect Iraqi Christians from persecution. Nebraska Congressman Jeff Fortenberry is here. When the World Over Live continues, stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. The flood of immigrants continues on the southern U.S. border. The House is wrestling with an emergency bill to address it. Earlier in the week, the U.S. House voted to authorize a lawsuit against the president for allegedly overstepping his constitutional authority regarding the health care law. Meanwhile, ISIS has continued to purge Christians and other religious minorities from northern Iraq. My next guest is here to address all of it. He's the U.S. Congressman from the 1st District of Nebraska, a member of the House Appropriations Committee, as well as the U.S. Caucus on Religious Minorities in the Middle East. He's also a co-sponsor of a bipartisan resolution 
to raise awareness about the plight of Iraqi Christians. I spoke with him a little earlier in our D.C. studio. Here's my interview with Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Congressman, I want to start talking about comprehensive immigration reform. This is a term we hear a great deal. The bishops are even advocating for this. You are not totally at peace with that term. Well, that's an interesting way to put it. I don't like the word comprehensive. Whenever you hear comprehensive on Capitol Hill, yeah. you can be assured that it will be a bill full of things that would never have seen the light of day if they were voted on in an individual fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with comprehensive immigration form. It's complex, mm -hmm. it's multi-layered, but there's really four components. It's border security, interior security, streamlining legal processes, and then foreign policy considerations. I want to shift to this terrible crisis on the border. All these minors coming across and young families uh, really risking their lives to come here. It's obvious they want a better life. They want something more than they have in their home country. How would you describe this crisis and to what do you attribute this latest influx of immigrants? Well, it's, it's a tragic crisis in a number of ways. We're calling it a surge of border children, mm. and it's primarily due to three factors. Um, desperate poverty, ungoverned space, and an exploitation of our laws. Mm. And I think there's three approaches to getting this back under control. Protecting the border, protecting the children, mm. and preventing the problem. Now underneath that, you have to break that apart and get yeah. to the various complex layers. Mm. You have to send a clear and consistent message, and it would be helpful if the president did this, that anyone who is coming here illegally will be returned home. We have to consistently demand that the countries, particularly of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, set up the right type of repatriation processes mm -hmm. so that children are treated humanely and are reunited with families. Then the third component of this is more robust border security because this is in disarray at the moment. The children are suffering, communities are suffering. If we get this back under control and create that systematic ordering of process once again, mm -hmm. Then you can consider the cases where there is a just need for asylum for children or others who are running from some form of persecution. Yeah. Now, you were a fierce advocate, one of the primary advocates for this 2008 anti trafficking correct. bill. Correct, so. And, and in that bill, it carves out those from Central America, particularly minors, they can't be turned around and deported quickly. Right. They, they, they have to remain. You can't do it. Do you support now changing that law? And is that part of what drew? particularly the minors here at this point? Well, certainly it would be incorrect to dismiss this as a factor. It could very well be a factor. The broader factors, as I said, poverty, exploitation yep. of our law, as well as ungoverned space. Mm -hmm. But the initial framework, particularly from the meeting, the media, was that it's the 08 law's problem. The 08 law was designed to prevent, to, to help people who are victims of human trafficking. I was not only uh, involved, I was a, a key leader yep. of this and proudly so, particularly on the child soldiers portion of this. Yeah. Uh, we could go ahead and change the law. I will support that. That treats children from Mexico differently from Central America, given that that is a corollary to this. But it's important to remember that this problem didn't start in 09, 10, 11, 12. It started in 13. And that's when the pre after the president had announced that he was going to decrease the number of deportations, uh -huh. that created the conditions whereby exploitation of laws could take place. Mm -hmm. The other factor here is, remember, these are children who are being exploited by human traffickers, coyotes as they're called, who sometimes, particularly young girls, are being subjected to horrific mm -hmm. crimes, and you can just use your imagination. Yeah, it's the how. human trafficking that, the, that 2008 the, law was designed to it, curb. And remember, trafficking is being brought somewhere against your will. Mm -hmm. It's not being brought somewhere in concert with being paying someone. Sure. So this is the complexity of the 08 law. Certainly we could go ahead and change that portion of it. To me that's reasonable, but there are a variety of other factors that have led to this surge of children on the border. John Boehner has put forward a new bill. It would change that law. It would grant the president $659 million, create more immigration judges, which you right. need, uh, and hopefully, according to the bill, hasten the deportations. Do you support this bill? Well, I'd, like, I'd rather use the term processing and repatriation for the humane treatment of children rather mm -hmm. than just deportations, because that's what we have to do here. Yeah. We have to get the border back under control, processes in place that can quickly determine the situation and status of the individual child, and then the humane treatment, the guarantee of humane treatment once they are returned, 
to their home country and reunited with their families. That's the three-step process that needs to take place here. Then we can establish, once again, some order down there. Remember, communities are suffering as well as these children. Mm -hmm. the, the hearings within a week, which would be one of the yes. mandates of the, of the law, you'd support that? Or is Absolutely. that too tight a requirement? The administration's already crying foul. They're saying the president's going to veto this, and it's asking too much to say you're going to turn these, the, these hearings around in one week. Well, right now, as I understand it, the hearing could take place between two years and five years mm -hmm. based upon the caseload. Something has to be done here, Raymond. You can't have a situation that is in chaos and disorder and have a good and vibrant and just immigration policy, yeah. which, by the way, has been the hallmark of American law and I think that one that we should return to. It is a core part of who we are. It's the heart of America, having a good, strong immigration policy. But when there's chaos and disorder in any part of it, you undermine the ability of the country to be generous in the first place. Congressman Luis Gutierrez has been a major advocate of comprehensive immigration reform. He had this to say about what the president's next step might be. Take a look. Look, I don't want to say that the president said this, but here's my understanding from having met with him and talking to others. I believe that millions upon millions of undocumented workers who have roots in the community, who have American citizen children, who have established businesses, who would benefit from the Senate bill, who, who would benefit from the Senate bill, I think the president's going to act. Your response to what you're hearing there? Well, I have two responses. First is, I think it's unconscionable that the, tech, that the president was in Texas a few weeks ago raising money and shooting pool while there is such a crisis on the border. I think he should have visited the border, understood the situation firsthand, and addressed the nation about what he was going to do. A clear and consistent message from the president would actually be the strongest of signals that we can send to help get this crisis back under control. The second issue is the president himself, a while back, said, I don't have the power to do this. Yeah. I cannot change the immigration laws like this myself. Now, if he's saying something different, that would be really, really odd. Well, the president just asked for $3.5 billion. He said he needs that for enforcement to, help, to hasten this, this immigration review process and the, and the judges needed to review these cases. Congress is saying we're not giving him that money. We're not giving a blank check for that much money. We, uh, we will, I will support tomorrow the figure you cited earlier. The $659, the 659 million. $659 million, mm -hmm. which gets us a couple months down the road that helps plug the holes in the system, brings the National Guard potentially to the border to give the Border Patrol some relief so that they can actually be about enforcing the law, sets up the conditions in which cases are heard more quickly, and then the humane, proper treatment of children as they are returned to their families back in Central America. Mm -hmm. The president, we give, that's going to take some money to do all those things. So I think it is legitimate to try to spend this money, but by the way, it's already budgeted. This is not new money. Mm -hmm. This is what we call reprogrammed money from ex the existing budget I see. to move toward this crisis. Now, some of your colleagues, Republican colleagues in the Senate, are opposed to this, this uh, bill entirely. Uh, I just bumped into Senator Ted Cruz. He's been whipping votes in the opposite direction against the Speaker and, and so many in your caucus. Jeff Sessions, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, had this to say. The President is preparing to assume for himself the absolute power to set immigration law in America. Well, I'll just enforce what I wish to enforce. The absolute power to determine who may enter and who may work, no matter what the law says by the millions. Our response now is of great import. It will define the scope of executive and congressional powers for years to come. If, the pre if President Obama is not stopped in this action and he exceeds his powers by attempting to execute such a massive amnesty contrary to law, the moral authority for any immigration enforcement henceforth will be eviscerated. Do you see it that way? Okay, if we do nothing, children will continue to surge across the border, and they will be placed in facilities that are costing the U.S. taxpayer $250 to $800 a day, and that includes military facilities mm -hmm. across the country. Their hearings will be in two to five years. Fifty, I believe the statistic is as much as 50 percent of, of, of people will not show up for those hearings, if I recall correctly. This is a crisis. It would be helpful if the president led in a forthright manner. Mm -hmm. If we got the border un under control, repatriated the children properly, and then had the case hearings, the, the, the judges in place to hear cases as they came along quickly. I, I just, you, 
to not act allows this to continue, but I don't think it necessarily sets up mm -hmm. uh, a further problem. It might be a partial solution at the moment, but inaction allows this situation to continue. And I just don't think that's a prudent course. Nancy Pelosi, uh, S former Speaker Pelosi, had this to say. She referenced the bishops and their advocacy for a just immigration reform. Listen. I, I always reference the Bishop, National Catholic Con uh, Bishop Conference of Bishops statement in which they said, maybe Jesus was a refugee from violence. Let us not turn away from these children and send them back into a burning building. That's the bishops. And that's, so we have to do this in a way that honors our values, but also protects our border and, and uh, does so in a way that the American people understand more clearly. Is that what's happening through this bill? Are we sending these children into a burning building? I, I don't understand the inconsistencies in, in her statement. Protects the border, but also allows anybody who just shows up in. Mm -hmm. Again, you, can, you cannot have compassion when there is disorder and chaos. You will undermine the ability of our very generous immigration system, which ought to remain the hallmark, I believe, of one of America's key policies. You'll undermine the country's ability to be generous if you have this chaos continue. The proper repatriation, returning of these children to their families, sends a very strong message to these coyotes, mm. to people who are hu engaged in human trafficking, who are exploiting families and children, that this is going to stop. It cost the Central American countries about $10 a day to house and protect these children properly mm. versus 250 to 800. To in not, the United States? In the United States. Wow. To not act is gravely irresponsible. Let's move on to the Senate. Harry Reid is saying there's a possibility that he may attach the Gang of Eight bill to the, the immigration reform bill that was rejected by the House, not even taken up by the House. He will attach that to a supplemental spending bill. Is that a possibility? And what are you and your colleagues uh, prepared to do if that should happen? Well, first of all, it's very hard for me to care about what Harry Reid says. Uh, they might as well hang a door sign out over there, out of order. Uh, they have, the House has passed 350 plus bills in this session. 350 sit over there in the Senate for their consideration. We are trying to engage in normal legislative function. And the dysfunction in the Senate uh, is just astounding. It is jamming things up till the end. It is creating these conditions where you have huge bills that are must pass at the end, and then things that wouldn't normally be able to get through get attached in the end. Mm. Uh, we'll have none of it on our side of the aisle. Yeah. So if he attaches it in the Senate, it's not a fait accompli. Would it have to still come back to the Absolutely. House or no? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let's move ahead to Israel. We continue to see this terrible carnage on both sides. More than uh, nearly 1,500 Palestinians killed, 53 Israeli soldiers, three civilians so far. There could be more now in Israel. Do you see a cessation to this violence? Is there any way to stop this? Is there a diplomatic approach that might work here? The whole situation is heartbreaking. Um, Israel, we, we wouldn't tolerate for 30 seconds rockets coming into an American mm -hmm. city that potentially kill people uh, from a sworn enemy who has said, we want your total destruction. We wouldn't tolerate that in a moment. And yet at the same time, all of our hearts are breaking to see the, the, the human casualties, the casualty, the, the, the nature of the violence. And then you ask yourself, what does this look like in 20 years? Where do we go in 20 years? Uh, I don't have a great answer. I don't have a good answer to your, to your uh, proposition. It is a desperately awful, grave conflict uh, between two entities that you, you just hope someday you could figure out a way to break past this impasse. Well, and, and our normal, the normal allies the United States would go to, Egypt or, or Syria or, or um, Jordan, uh, none of these players have any real sway in this situation any longer. Isn't that part of the problem as well? We've sort of, we, we, we've, we've so uh, mistreated in some ways the allies in the Middle East. This is a very good point. I don't think regional instability is a help to Israel. Uh, Egypt seems to be rebounding and recalculating itself and mm -hmm. establishing some stability again and hopefully the relationship with Israel, with both, e between Egypt and Israel as well as the United States improves dramatically. Mm -hmm. They can have a role as a potential broker in this over time, but right now it's all collapsed. I it's just pure violence. I want to play something for you. It gives you some, some insight into what 
Israel is dealing with and the Hamas situation. This is Mossab Hassan Youssef. Now, he is the son of a Hamas leader. He converted to Christianity. He was interviewed on CNN the other day. Listen. That Hamas does not care about the lives of uh, uh, Palestinians, does not care about the lives of Israelis or Americans. Mm -hmm. They don't care about their own lives. Uh, they consider uh, dying for the sake of uh, their ideology a, a way of worship. Hamas is not seeking coexistence and uh, uh, compromise. Hamas is seeking uh, conquest and uh, taking over. Cards for either of these players, Israel or Hamas, to come to peace. And can peace, is it possible when you have an aggressor like this on the other side of the border from Israel. What has gotten to be even more difficult in the last year is Fatah, the ruling authority in the uh, West Bank, has drawn closer, created some alliance with Hamas. And that was very, very disturbing uh, in many ways because y you had some hope, again, with the quiet but very real cooperation that went on in the West Bank between the Palestinian Authority, Israel, as well as America. We helped establish those relationships that somehow this could transcend, Hamas could diminish. Remember, they seized the election. They were democratically elected, and then they turned around and killed their opposition. Mm -hmm. And so the gentleman who you just quoted, uh, it's a powerful eyewitness to certain realities there that we, I don't think we fully understand here, how somebody could act with such irrationality, subject their own people to being killed, not have any interest in pursuing peace, mm -hmm. and provoke this type of violence. It's very hard for us to understand. I, I don't have a good answer as to the way out. Last week, we opened the show with uh, an expose on what's happening to the Christians in Iraq. And when you see the pictures, when you see the destruction of Jonah's tomb, when you see these monasteries being taken over, uh, this report, St. Ephra Ephraim, Syriac Orthodox Church, uh, on the east side of Mosul, ISIS converted it into a mosque and installed loudspeakers for, for prayers throughout the day. Uh, the Syriac Catholic Church in the old part of Mosul looted and torched, and all the Christians have been driven out. You have sponsored a bipartisan resolution. What would that effectively do? What does it ask for? Well, first of all, I think all of us, not just here in the United States, but internationally, if there is a responsible community of nations left, mm -hmm. we must get our mind around what is happening there. It is a genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, this group called ISIS, the Islamic State of, of Iraq, Israel and Syria, and Syria, or, uh, Iraq, Iraq and Syria, Syria uh, are uh, uh, fanatical zealots who fly the black banner of death. Who would have imagined a month ago they would have taken large swaths of Iraq with very little resistance? Mm -hmm. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq. For 1,600 years, it has had a flourishing Christian community. Now, no Christians are left, not one. And what else happened was when ISIS entered there, they spray painted this mm -hmm. on the doors of the remaining Christian families in their businesses. Yeah, which has become a ubiquitous sign all over the internet. It's the Arab letter for N, which stands for Nazarene, which is a denigrating term to the Christians used by some, mm -hmm. except they didn't spray paint it in gold. They sprayed, spray painted it in red, blood red. Mm -hmm. And they said to the Christians, you have to leave, convert to Islam, or die by the sword. Hmm. No, and, and, they are, and they are leaving. They fled. Your resolution requests what? The resolution basically asks that the international community expedite humanitarian aid there to help the Christians as well as other religious minorities who are decimated. It calls upon the UN Security Council to act, which by the way just passed a resolution 50 to nothing mm -hmm. unanimously to provide humanitarian assistance in Syria. So we have a template there yeah. so that it's not the United States alone. We would be participating with the international community of trying to move some humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. This is a desperate situation. Tomorrow it's hopeless, in a few days it's lost. So this is why we've tried to aggressively move this resolution before the United States Congress. Hopefully we can get a vote soon. I, I'm so gravely disturbed by this. I, I was able to meet with the uh, Archbishop of Baghdad, the Archbishop of Mosul, as well as the Patriarch of the Syriac Church recently in Congress. And uh, Raymond, it just makes you want to cry what these men are suffering. No, it's horrible. It's horrible. The communities are decimated and probably never to return, but the people that are run to that Nineveh plain, they should be protected. Something should be done. Now, your resolution asks for the Kurds to be given some uh, 
support at least, encouragement. What, what is the real effect of the resolution, though? The Paul? real effect would, again, first of all, heighten awareness mm -hmm. of the situation and maybe mm -hmm. slow down the deterioration, hopefully move some humanitarian assistance, encourage yeah. the Kurds to act in a responsible manner as they broaden their horizons and potentially become the de facto stabilizing yeah. new state right. in the area there. And then that may perhaps over time lead to some sort of Christian autonomous, other religious minorities such as Yazidis in a more autonomous zone where they can participate in a larger governance of that area, mm -hmm. maybe in some type of strategic partnership with the Kurds. That's what I'm hoping mm -hmm. because I am very worried about Baghdad regenerating itself mm -hmm. here and providing protection. Where, how's it going to happen? How realistic is passage at this point? Well, we're going to do everything we can. Most members are interested in this, but as you're quite aware, we're at the end of the uh, yeah. summer session, and, uh, and it is just a desperate scramble to get all kinds of things done, including the border bill. As yeah. well as we just passed a VA reform bill. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, that is actually going to be signed into law, so yeah. there's something constructive there. You also uh, voted to sue the president, a majority voted, slim majority, mostly Republicans, all Republicans, I think, no Democrats, to sue the president. Why is that necessary? Constitution of the United States. Uh, there is a balance of power in the Constitution. There are three branches of government. The legislature makes the laws. The president enforces, ex executes the law. Mm -hmm. The judicial branch interprets the law when there is a question. Mm -hmm. So, because the president, regarding the new health care law, has unilaterally and substantively changed it 24 times, mm -hmm. we consider this to be basically a violation of his duty. Uh, as executive officer. And so mm -hmm. we're instead of this getting over politicized, right. move it to the court system, let the court decide. And the and this will go directly now to the Supreme Court, I imagine. Yes, the House, the, the it's the speaker who would sue him, correct? No, it is the House of Representatives. The whole House. That is wow. correct. It is the institution. That's what makes this unique. It has mm -hmm. never been done in the history of the Republic, but it is a recourse that the legislative branch is trying to say to the president mm -hmm. If we don't decide on something, therefore, it's our problem, right. not the executive problem, branch's problem. If the law says something that you don't like, you can't unilaterally change it. You have to bring it back to Congress. Mm -hmm. That's the way the system's supposed so to work. So it goes right to the Supreme Court, I would imagine, yes? I don't know well, the, the circuit of that court. process. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, the ambassador at large for religious freedom, that position has sat vacant since last fall. The president just appointed Rabbi Nathaniel Saperstein. Now, this is being viewed as a controversial appointment in some quarters. Some say this is a guy who, who's opposed to the Hobby Lobby ruling. He thinks it's troubling that uh, an organization would be granted its religious liberty and have a right in, in what its employees do, or the, the coverage offered. He also uh, works for an organization that has been militantly pro-abortion in the last uh, th throughout their history. Your thoughts on that appointment? Well, uh, I'll have to learn more about it, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. I, I don't know his background well. Um, I think that the deeper principle here of religious liberty, this is the International Religious Freedom Commission, mm -hmm. but the deeper principle of religious liberty of having some limits on governmental power. The purpose of the government is to protect rights, not to confer rights, not to give mandates that actually make people choose between obeying the law and obeying that sacred space, their deepest mm -hmm. right to religious freedom as well as their conscience. If that's his position, that, that's indeed troubling. But I will just tell you, we've got so much work to do in terms of international religious freedom in Iraq and other places throughout the world mm -hmm. where this most fundamental basic of human rights is under threat. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, he's going to have a lot thrown at him very rapidly. Yeah. I, I frankly would like to build a relationship. I'm trying to build a relationship with the larger commission because mm -hmm. I see their work as becoming more and more per important yeah. as people around the world recognize this, this basic freedom. We're not understanding it well and we're not protecting it properly. Mm -hmm. No, and it's not part of the foreign policy puzzle which it needs to be Correct. and the calculations. Yeah. Congressman Fortenberry, thank you so Pleasure much for being you. here as thank always. You. When we return, our Unseen Hero segment, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Ron Suskind joins us to discuss his son's autism and the surprising key that unlocked his voice. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. 
Welcome back to the world over. About two million people are diagnosed with autism in the U.S. alone. Half a million are children. One in 54 are boys. My next guest has very personal experience with autism. At three years of age, his perfectly normal son, Owen, suddenly stopped speaking. The boy couldn't sleep or eat. Owen's only relief from his withdrawal from life were the animated Disney films he watched with his brother. Tonight, our Unseen Hero segment features Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author of the new book, Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism. Ron Suskind joined me recently via satellite to discuss this inspiring memoir, his family's struggle with autism, and the power of affinity therapy. Here's my interview with Ron Suskind. Ron, you and your wife noticed when Owen was about three years old, he just stopped communicating. What did you see? What did you think at That's that right. moment? Well, you know, we, we were just uh, the typical happy family moving forward. Two boys, uh, my older son is five, Owen, uh, mm -hmm. at that point was just shy of three. And, uh, you know, first we, we didn't notice uh, and wondered. We, we, we didn't know what to think. You know, we, uh, you know, he was stopped. He stopped speaking. He wouldn't make eye contact. He was very uh, unhappy. And, um, and it was a mystery, like uh, there had been a kidnapping. Wow. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I said to my wife, kids don't grow backwards. What could right. this be? And then a few months later, uh, we heard the word autism for the first time. And then later, even after that, we were told this is kind of uh, called regressive autism. Yeah, what does where that mean? Where just shy of three years old, somewhere between a year and a half and three of the kids regress, meaning they go backwards uh, and lose speech. He lost all speech, so he couldn't talk after that. Hmm. And, and the doctors at this point, um, they, they were at a, bit of a, at a bit of a loss. He is watching Disney films obsessively. And the doctors right. caution you about indulging what they called his obsessions or his fixations. What did you think? That's right. That's right. That's the thinking at that point, and has been for many decades, uh, that these affinities, his obsessions, uh, are not healthy. Uh, that hmm. many, many kids on the autism spectrum, which is now about 3 million folks in the United States and 70 million worldwide, and, and mind you, it's one out of 42 boys, according to the Centers for Disease Control uh, just this spring. Uh, that's 2.5% of the male population of the United States. Extraordinary. Wow. The view is, is that these, uh, these passions, these obsessions are more prison than pathway, that the kids get involved in this, it's like a wheel in the ditch, mm -hmm. they can't get out, and you should try to wean them off of it or cut it off. Um, and, um, and we got that advice for many years from very fine specialists who we had great admiration for and, and still do. Uh, but what we found is when he watched his Disney favorites, which he loved before the onset of the autism at about two and a half, uh, he just seemed contented. The only place he seemed happy and contented was there. And then uh, he was speaking in bits of gibberish uh, after about a year, you know, just like baby talk. Mm -hmm. And at one point he was saying, Juicervos, Juicervos. And then we were watching uh, one day The Little Mermaid, uh, all of us, the two of us together, his older brother. Uh, and all of a sudden he was rewinding the part where Ariel, the protagonist from that movie, loses her voice, has to trade uh, her voice to become human. And the sea witch says, just your voice. He rewinds again. Hmm. After a minute, my wife says, he's not saying juice, he's saying just. I grab Owen, I say, just your voice. He says, juicer voice, juicer voice. Huh. And at that moment, we saw something that has turned into a new way of looking at autism and maybe how to treat autism, too. Well, it's called affinity therapy. We called it Disney therapy when uh, Owen was young. We had to give it some kind of name. And, uh, and now it's, it's changing the way, I think, uh, folks uh, see this this condition and and Ron explain to people what you believe your son took from the repeated viewing of these Disney movies and why these Disney films it was basically a handful of them Aladdin Little Mermaid Beauty and the Beast yeah. sort of the hand-drawn 90s cartoons yeah and, and back and he went back to Dumbo and mm -hmm. uh, you know Snow White and all the rest the hand-drawn seemed to have more of, of a hold on him what we found is that and, and this is something we're, we're hearing from many, many parents, is that these hand-drawn animated uh, features, especially, that are emotionally rich, have a particular hold on this community. 
uh, because the, the exaggerated uh, uh, expressions of the characters and the scenes that you can understand even with the sound off, as Walt Disney uh, way back told his animators, that's what he wanted, mm -hmm. uh, allow a kind of safe place where these kids can rewind again and again and draw deeper and deeper meaning from these iconic stories, frankly, stories that go back thousands of years that human beings have always used to make their way in the world. Hmm. Well, Owen and many kids like them uh, have had to live on a diet of what they can see and hear, these movies rewound over and over again, um, uh, very exclusively or, or in great concentrations and they've drawn meaning from this. So, so uh, as Owen says, he had to live in a diet of myth, fable, and legend for so much of his life. Huh. But what it built in him was an acuity, an understanding of the power of story in yeah. shaping our lives. And that's something all human beings know. Hmm. Uh, it's just this extreme case of Owen and so many kids like him are teaching us this, uh, this powerful lesson now. Ron, was it the moral clarity of these stories? I mean, there is sort of a strong through line in all these Disney classics. Yeah, there's no doubt that that was part of the hold. And Owen can talk about that now. He's, he's a little like Temple Grandin, uh, <laughs> that well-known autistic lady. Owen yeah. can describe what it felt like now. He's 23. <laughs> but yeah, that was a big part of it. It was not just the emotional richness, but it was the moral precept, <laughs> uh, the moral prescription and lessons in these movies that he held tight to. And, 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 and it really helped him he find his them voice. early on, exactly. And what's interesting about it is as he, as he walked out into the world as a teenager, he began to test these in the world of shades of gray, of human interaction. Does love last forever? How does one uh, end up being true to oneself? Uh, is the nature of friendship uh, lasting? Uh, you know, what does it mean to see beauty uh, within? And, uh, and that's what uh, gave him such powerful moral clarity and, and it was helpful also with his religious life. Uh, we're Jewish, mm -hmm. and Owen, uh, you could feel the spiritual energy and the, and the moral mm -hmm. energy coming from these movies yeah. as something that enlightened and, in, and in energized him at his bar mitzvah uh, mm -hmm. when he gives his bar mitzvah speech in the, in the book, which is quite moving. Beautiful. No, it's beautiful. And I, I love this line he wrote where he said, I'm the protector of the sidekicks and no sidekick gets left behind. Tell me what importance that had in your life, in his life, and your understanding of where he was and how he saw himself in the family. Well, it's fascinating. That, that's when he got his first real whack. He was thrown out of a school uh, for autistic spectrum kids and learning disabled kids. It was a stretch for him, it was difficult, but it was really his home. He'd been there for five years, and of course, these are kids who have trouble with change. He's about 11 years old. He doesn't have enough speech to really describe how he feels. He goes down to the basement of our house, and this is the place, mind you, where we play out the movies. Mm -hmm. Once we realized a few years before that if you threw him a line, he'd throw you back the next line, we started to, to become animated characters. We became all of the key characters in all the movies. That's how we conversed with them. We spoke in Disney dialogue. Mm -hmm. He goes to the basement, and after a while, we see he's drawing furiously. Uh, and he's drawing sidekicks, huh. uh, no heroes, uh, and, and he becomes an expert on the sidekicks. He doesn't feel now like a hero himself. He, he feels like a sidekick. A sidekick helps the hero fulfill his destiny, but, but not for him. And, uh, and at the end of a book, a, a sketchbook with 100 sidekicks, no heroes, he writes two things. I am the protector of the sidekicks. And finally, he writes, no sidekick gets left behind. But my wife is Catholic. And, um, and she says, well, that's, that's out of uh, either the New or the Old Testament. Uh, that, that is a powerful philosophical position, mm -hmm. uh, the notion that we really are all sidekicks deep down. And the key is no sidekick will be left behind. That, that became his view of his place in the world. Mm. I love that he goes on to college. Um, he, he's now dating. He starts a Disney club at, at college. Tell me about that. Tell yeah. me how Owen's doing now. He's doing great. So, so he, he, uh, uh, he just graduated from this college program after three years. Wow. Uh, he started Disney Club as soon as he gets there. Uh, and, and at that point, I'm at Harvard. I'm the writer in residence at the Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. We drive from Harvard Square out to Cape Cod, where his school is, and there's a room full of Owens. There's 12 <laughs> kids just like him. And, and they were not raised, these kids, under the intense 
affinity therapy method that we had developed. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. Many of them, they had the same passion Owen did. They said everything can be found in these iconic myths and narratives. And, and we basically said to these kids, you're not crazy, you're right. Hmm. And as we did, we opened it up, and it was like a dam break. They just opened up emotionally, spiritually, and began to talk about the characters that spoke to them. One of the kids in the first meeting, I said, what character is the character that, that you've embraced? And he says, this is a kid with very little speech, mind you. Huh. He says, Pinocchio. And I said, why? He says, because, you know, I, I, I feel like a wooden boy. Mm. And I've always dreamed of feeling what real boys feel. Mm. And I was born with wooden eyes. That's a powerful uh, a personal insight that, frankly, a typical 18-year-old would have trouble mustering. Right. And that's the way it worked. And, and his girlfriend in Disney Club, he's been going out for two years with her, Emily. <laughs> She's a Dumbo girl. <laughs> and she'll explain to you why. Uh, she, uh, she embraced Dumbo. Many of the kids who have no speech, she didn't have speech when she was small, mm -hmm. embraced non-speaking characters, Dumbo, Pluto, who express all emotions without words. Emily will tell you, she says, well, why Dumbo? Because the thing uh, that made him an outcast, those big ears, uh, it, well, that's something I understand she said in my life. Mm. But what Dumbo learned, I learned too. So the thing that makes you different, well, it allows you to soar. And that's, a, again, a powerful notion of how the things that distinguish us are often our greatest gifts, even if the one-size-fits-all models that we often use to judge people and value mm -hmm. them or not value them um, is something that, uh, that we often fall, our, uh, fall into in no, our it really, lives. It really gave them a lexicon uh, of language to communicate, a way in which, and it, it seems to me, Ron, and we only have a minute, um, I've been reading this book, uh, Writing from the Right Side of the Brain, where, you know, you're, you're engaging a different side of the brain, the more creative side. Is that what you think they're tapping into through these Disney classics? There's no doubt. And what we have found, and this is the thing that's being studied at, at NIH, uh, at Yale, at, at MIT, all part of this new explosion of affinity therapy, mm -hmm. is, that, is that, you know, the fact is, is that some of the traditional ways we show ability or cognition, it just doesn't work for these kids. But, but it's just like high school science. The energy goes somewhere if a, if a pathway is blocked. Mm -hmm. They have special abilities in the areas of their affinity. Thank and you, that's Ron. what we're now studying. And we're using that to find ways that they could pull themselves forward on their own using these special gifts. And almost every kid's got them. The question is, where is that special gift? And, and we're right now on a, on a kind of national mission and even international. That's what I spoke about at the United Nations. Great. To find those gifts so that these kids can carry forward their own lives powerfully and often with great passion and spiritual energy, which I think is what you're seeing in the book. Life Animated, a story of sidekicks, heroes, and autism by Ron Suskind is available at bookstores everywhere and online. And you can find out more about Ron's Autism Affinities Project by visiting lifeanimated.net. When we return, he's the leader of 85 million Filipino Catholics, but his influence doesn't end there. An encore of my exclusive interview with Archbishop of Manila, Cardinal Luis Tagle, is straight ahead. Stay there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. My next guest is the head of one of the fastest growing Catholic populations in the world. He's the Archbishop of Manila, and at 57, one of the youngest cardinals in the church. He's been appointed by Pope Francis as one of the three presidents of the upcoming Extraordinary Synod of Bishops for the Family in October. When I sat down with him recently at Catholic University, he spoke candidly about the focus of that synod, including the controversy over the treatment of divorced and remarried Catholics receiving communion. Here's an encore of my exclusive interview with Cardinal Luis Tagle. You and your church are so responsible for exporting priests yes. to Europe, to the United States, States, to a lot of the Northern Hemisphere. Yes. Uh, you have 7,000 priests roughly in, yes, in, in, uh, the Philippines. in the Philippines. You have 85 million Catholics. <laughs> yes. Is there a crisis going on? I mean, I know it's a circulation of yeah, love by oh, sending your, yes. your, your best and brightest yes. to other countries. 
But are you facing something of a crisis internally? Well, we, uh, that has always been the situation, by the way. We have been used to having one priest for a big, big parish. Mm -hmm. So in terms of crisis, if it is a crisis, then we, are, we have gotten used to the yeah, crisis. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not commonplace new. now. Yeah, it's commonplace. <laughs> it's commonplace. Yeah. And uh, I think what saves us, though, is the fact that many of our priests are relatively young. Mm. You know, and uh, there is great participation on the part of the lay people. Mm. And, and that lessens a lot of the uh, concerns and the, also the weight. Yeah. No? of ministry. Now, Pope Francis recently appointed you as one of the co-presidents of this upcoming yes. synod, a very important synod on the family, yes. taking place in Rome this fall, yes. and it'll continue into the next year. This next year. You have, have been quoted in interviews most recently in the Boston Globe um, as saying you are open to hearing arguments as to uh -huh. whether Catholics can be divorced and remarried without annulments. Why? I was quoted as saying John that. Allen quotes you as saying oh. that you were open to arguments where uh, a Catholic okay. might be ca uh, married, really? divorced and remarried uh -huh. without an annulment. Are you? Oh, I, you know, uh, I don't recall, uh, I don't recall the, the conversation focusing on that, no. Mm -hmm. What I recall of the conversation is this, that uh, we, when, when we had this converse, th that conversation, uh, we just came from the consistory uh -huh. where Cardinal Casper right. uh, gave a whole uh, presentation. Right. And the discussion that ensued, you know, opened for me personally a whole range of uh, a whole range of concerns and issues that I was ignorant of. Mm -hmm. So I said, "Wow, there's so much to learn, yeah. especially now that I'm a, a president delegate." Yes. No, so I am open to all the perspectives that could help us shed mm -hmm. light on the issue. Do, do you think, with your study and your understanding mm -hmm. of theology, certainly far uh -huh. surpassing mine? Uh, <laughs> Is it possible to f envision uh -huh. a policy that would allow Catholics to divorce and remarry without an annulment, given the church teaching and Christ's teaching on yeah. the indissolubility of marriage? Is it possible? I just came from a meeting of uh, uh, the preparatory committee mm -hmm. for the synod. Thing, this, the following things are very clear. The teaching of Jesus and the teaching of the church will not be changed. No, what people are looking at right now, especially the canonists, mm -hmm. is this. No, uh, how could canon law, how could canon law and its procedures, no, reflect more clearly, no, the teaching of Jesus Christ, no, mm -hmm. and the teaching of the church because some some people are claiming that the canonical procedures mm -hmm. are, uh, too rigid. are too rigid and uh, also mm -hmm. some are even asking uh, the, do the canonical prescriptions uh, are they clear about the doctrinal mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. or is the legal canonical path taking its own way uh, quite separately from ah. the doctrinal uh, dimension. You know? The other thing is uh, it also became quite clear that every, let's call it, failed marriage mm -hmm. is quite unique. Mm -hmm. you, 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 uh, it's difficult to say all mm -hmm. you know, uh, marriages that ended up in divorce, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, because when you, when you deal with cases and you deal with with, with persons, individual individuals' lives, lives sure. then you have to. Uh, but that's the annulment see. process, yes, correct? That's I mean, that's why you have process. the annulment process. Yes, so, is yes. that what the focus of this is? Reforming the annulment, annulment process? process. That's, that has become a big, big. Uh, mm -hmm. So, doctrinally, 
I mean, how can you change the word of the Bible or the words of Jesus? No. But Cardinal but, Casper seems to be suggesting something akin to that, though, in that presentation, which I know was hostily received by a lot of the cardinals present. Uh, uh, but, uh, no, but, but he, he responded to that. Yes. He said uh, he was talking there as a theologian mm -hmm. who, who did a lot of uh, historical... In fact, in the Analysis, meeting yester yeah. yesterday, there was another perspective that came up. No? The uh, canonical tradition of the Eastern Rite churches. Right. You know, right. how they handle so called uh, divorces and second marriages. Uh -huh. But of course, the, the Synod will not focus only on this uh, yes. situation. Well, we see because, the media coverage of this seems yeah. to focus on. Uh, and For example, in the Philippines, we don't have divorce. Right. Uh -huh. uh, so well, if we, if the whole synod is uh, about divorce and you need to get off the president's council, well, <laughs> maybe just call a, a synod for countries with uh, yeah, with exactly. divorce. No, but we have families where the the couples are are separated not because they're they're they they don't want to live with one another, but they're de facto separated by poverty, mm -hmm. by migration. Mm -hmm. It's not anger towards one another that made them decide to separate, mm. but it is the love for each other and for the children. Yeah. You know, that's a totally different situation. Are you concerned that a combination of certain individuals and the media are hijacking this synod and changing it into something it was never envisioned to be? That's always a, that's always a, a, a danger, you know, because uh, uh, people. Uh, have their own interests and they have their own agenda, you know. So they they express in their form of reporting uh, some sort of uh, <laughs> a support you know, mm -hmm. for for their uh, agenda, yeah. you know. But I sit on the preparatory committee of the synod, and I tell you, the communion of the divorced uh, re remarried is just one item among many, 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 many items. Mm -hmm. There are at least eight major topics, and that is just one. Mm -hmm. And they always say this is a, a North Atlantic, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> North Atlantic concern. Mm -hmm. When you go to Africa, That's when you go to Asia, you know, and, and for us, for example, because of migration, yeah. You know, uh, the, the fabric of, of, of the family mm. is really tested. Mm. Mm. And so we are asking for serious pastoral care for migrants so that they could remain faithful to their spouses left at home or to their children. People say you are the Asian Pope Francis. Oh, my. <laughs> Pope Francis is Pope Francis. How do you I, react to that? <laughs> I smile. I don't, I don't take it seriously. <laughs> I mean, I know Pope Francis. We worked together for three years mm -hmm. in uh, the, uh, the Council of the Synod. Ah. You know, he is his person. I am not. I am not him. But uh, if there are, there are uh, I, I worked longer with Cardinal Ratzinger. And I, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> well, uh, I think what they're yeah. talking about is your way of life. You, you lead a simple way of life. You, mm. you, you are mingling with the public, you're available mm. to people. One yeah. can look at your face and see the joy yeah. of your faith. <laughs> um, I think that's what they're yeah, saying. Maybe that. Well, if, if it is that, then I'm happy. <laughs> that, well, good. Uh, <laughs> well, we're happy too. Your yeah. Eminence, thank you so much for your oh, time. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at Raymond Arroyo. Com. Be sure to tune in next week for encores of my exclusive interviews with Saddleback Church Pastor Rick Warren and Bishop Kevin Van of Orange, California. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.